Hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program that we call Things We Said Today. This is a show in which we talk about what's happening in the news with the Beatles. I'm Ken Michaels, one of the co-hosts of the show, also known from my syndicated Beatles program called Every Little Thing. And I'm being joined by my co-host, the man who writes for Beatles Examiner, and many Examiner columns, that being Steve Marinucci. Hi, Steve. Hi, Ken. Hello, everyone. On today's show, we're going to talk about something that just happened the weekend prior to this taping, and that being the Fest for Beatle fans in Los Angeles. And just like uh, many shows back when I attended the uh, Fest for Beatle fans in New York City, and I was the only one amongst the two of us who could talk about it, Steve was there in L.A. for this. And this actually was the first time, believe it or not, in 14 years that they had a Fest for Beatle fans in Los Angeles. So first of all, my obvious first question would be, what was the attendance like? Well, the attendance of first night was was low, and I, you know, even back 14 years ago, when I used to go to the the fest, uh, which by the way we're at the same location, the Los Angeles Airport Marriott, which is um, not very far, from, obviously right close to the the airport. You know, the first night was always low, and they the one change they made was that the fest store was no longer in the dealer room it was separate and i and and so i think that had something to do with the with the attendance uh, you know uh, or at least things being slow in the dealer room i know a lot of the dealers were talking about how how slow it was in there but the first night is always slow because people are That's arriving right. a lot of people are coming in by plane by car by whatever you know uh, we got in there I'm trying to remember oh we didn't stay in in at the Marriott, we stayed in Burbank because of other plans we had after the fest, and so it took us it took us an hour and a half to get there the first night because of the tra- the LA traffic. It did not that did not happen the other two nights, and that again that also may have contributed to the low attendance that night is the LA traffic and people not wanting to deal with it. So well, first of all, we, we should point out as you just said, and this is the case. Every time I go to the one in New Jersey, Friday mm-hmm. always, always will have the lightest turnout. The right. people who go to the Friday one are basically the people who go for the entire weekend. And, you know, that's that's not the majority of the people, I think. I, I, I Well, there are a lot of people that will go for all three days. Don't get me wrong. But the, the right. biggest attendance will always be on Saturday. And the people who can't make it Saturday go on Sunday. But nobody ever goes just Friday. Right. Unless and for that's... some reason... You know, they can't make it on Saturday or Sunday, and that's very rare. But people generally go on Saturday or Sunday, and Saturday is always the biggest turnout. It has always been all, that way. And all the bigger events happen on Saturday or Sunday. The, there's only there's usually just very, you know, um, small events on Friday, welcome event, you know, welcome to the, the authors. There were a couple of those on Friday night. But... Uh, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Things are always slow on Friday, and it's you know it shouldn't be a surprise com- that that that's the case. I don't know what. But overall, I don't know what else. Yeah. overall, yeah. I thought Saturday was good, and I thought Sunday was was better than I remember because I always remember Sunday being very very slow. But it but it really picked up on Sunday. Part of the reason of that was Peter Asher was only there on Sunday, and his show mm. got. Very good attendance, but now um, how, from what you observed, did a lot of people show up for the guests, and I mean the historic guests, somebody like Peter Asher, Billy J. Kramer, Mark Rivera was there, of course, Mark Hudson, who's been a mainstay for many years in New Jersey and Chicago. He's been part of the fest for well over ten years now. They had so many great guests. Joey Malin was there, Lawrence Juber, uh, Denny Sywell. Denny Lane, <laughs> you know there were several right. Wings members there. Was there a great turnout for those guests? I'll tell you one person who was very popular and who had a very long line of people looking for autographs was Frida Kelly. Frida Kelly mm. was there, and Frida was extremely popular. Um, and I, I did not attend all of Frida's events. I, I, I'm sorry to say uh, we were busy trying to talk to interview people, which we did. I did, I think I did about 40 interviews during the fest. 
And so wow. I was bu- I, and I was busy. So I was busy talking to people more than attending, you know, events. Um, but yeah, Frida's line, Frida had a long line, and I noticed also that after his show, Peter Asher had a very long line. But there was a lot of, I mean, there were a lot of people looking at, uh, looking for, you know, autographs too, um, you know. So I mean, it, it. But Frida Kelly consistently had a long line. It was, it was very amazing that you know that she was getting a lot of response for the movie. But um, not only the fact that um, that she has such a unique story to tell and people love the movie, but it's such a rare occurrence that this is even happening in the first place. And you have so many guests who have been recurring guests. Like I said, Mark Hudson's there every single year and certain people right. show up every few years like Lawrence Juber. But Frida Kelly, this could be a one time only thing for for, you know, this past year or so with the uh, the DVD out. And the documentary, right. so makes it even more special. Yeah, somebody else that was there for the first time, and and you know you don't know if he'll be back is uh, Bob Eubanks. Bob Eubanks was there talking mm. about uh, the uh, promoting the uh, the Hollywood Bowl shows. Um, I'm trying, you know, I, I again I I spent a lot of time talking to you know uh, the authors, and I did see some of the. The sessions. Uh, I know Dave Morrell, who we've had on the show, had a great right. session. Uh, with um, you know, with about his book, um, talking about you know rarities and talking about giving John Yellow Matter custard the bootleg, and the mm-hmm. one session I got, I got, and then there was a new, a, you know, a couple of news items that, or one news item that came out of the show that Bruce Spicer alerted me to is that he had recently, and I'm gonna, we'll get more details on this. He had recently gotten some of the non uh, non capital recordings. Uh, gold record certification, mm-hmm. um, and this just happened recently. So that, uh, and in fact, he descri- he talked about that in the session he did late Sunday afternoon, which by that time, you know, a lot of people were gone, and this the session really didn't have many people because I went to it. But uh, it was it was a very it was very interesting interesting because he had all the documents and everything on the screen. And then another session I went to was Kid O'Toole's Ten Beatles Sounds That Changed the World. Which the title doesn't sound like anything, but when you sat there and she had all the sounds extracted, and then she played them in the context of the songs, and she talked about the significance and the meaning and everything, and the inf- and the how they, you know, the relevance and everything. That was a fascinating session, and mm. uh, according and that had gotten, um, according to what I was told, that had gotten a uh, standing ovation in um Beatles at the Ridge which 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 was another recent Beatle event in the Midwest and um but that was a fascinating and and again you know I mean it was late on Sunday afternoon and there wasn't you know there weren't the couple of events that I attended none of them seemed to be the the spoken events the you know the in the little rooms didn't seem to get a lot of attention uh, but I'm sure there I'm sure there were exceptions to that rule I mean I was involved with three events one was an interview of me by Al Sussman one mm-hmm. was the a thing with the solo Beatles uh, about the, we were talking about solo, solo Beatles songs and then another was an interview I did with Candy Leonard of Beatleness the author of Beatleness uh, and so, I mean, it was it, the people were out, you know, looking at looking at, uh, you know, looking for things to buy, listening to music in the big ballroom. So, you know, there was a lot. To, the you know, the thing is, and we were remarking about this afterwards. There was so much to do. There was no way you could do everything, and you had to make your, you know, you had to pick and choose what you were going to do. And Steve, if, if you remember when I was talking about the fest in New York. I said the exact same thing. There's no way that you can do everything that you want to do. And even if you're there for all three days, there's just so much going on. And in particular, uh, this past year, if you look at the the fest in New York, in Chicago, and now L.A., there were more guests than ever before. Right. <laughs> you know, it, they really bombarded it with with guests. And if you're like me and you want to talk to every guest, and hear what they have to say, and hear panels, or, or when they're interviewed, it's almost impossible to see that. And then, if you do watch an interview, you could be missing a performance somewhere, or a panel right. discussion somewhere. 
uh, it's it's just impossible. That's that's the frustrating thing if you're into every aspect of the Beatles like we are, that you can't do everything that you want to do. But yeah. there are people, a lot of young fans care more about seeing their friends up there on stage performing Beatles songs, and that's a real fun aspect of it, too. But tell me about the panels that you were on. First of all, when Al Sussman interviewed you, what was that like? What did you talk about? Well, the Al Sussman interview was more of a uh, about my career as a writer, how I got into writing about the Beatles. You know, when I started, he, he went back and talked about the Abbey Road site. He talked about how I became, you know, I started writing for the Examiner. We got into a whole a whole lot of details about that and about, you know, covering, keeping track of, of Beatle news on a daily basis. It's that, you know, it was that kind of, that, that was more of a, you know, introducing or, you know, telling people about me, um, that kind of thing. And I, you know, that was fun for me. And there were, there were some people there that had never met me that came up to me afterwards and were real pleased to meet me in person and everything. So, and I think some of them are probably listening to this show because they mm. told me they, they told me they were fans of the show and, and they, they liked us. And so that was, uh, that was a lot of fun. And then the, the solo Beatles thing was with Andrew Grant Jackson and his book um, about solo Beatles songs. I contributed to the paperback version uh, a couple of comments about about solo songs, and we were allowed to do that again. And we talked, and and Wally Pedrasic, uh moderated that. Um, actually, Wally was one, running all over the place because he was moderating several events. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like at the same time, but he was moderating our event, and he asked us questions and everything like that. And we each gave our opinions on, on a couple of songs. And I think I mentioned Mull of Kintyre was one, and I mentioned Ballroom Dancing for another. But uh, everybody kind of got into their own, you know, their own songs. Uh, I, I can't remember. I think uh, Al Sussman mentioned um, Sure to Fall by Ringo. Who was on this panel that you just mentioned, you and Andrew, but who else? It was uh, An- me, Andrew, Kid O'Toole, Anthony Robostelli, I believe Al was in there, although the picture I just posted on Facebook today didn't have Al's picture in it, but I thought Al was in there. I don't have my program with me, um, but Robert Rodriguez was in there also. Okay. So that was very interesting. Uh, that was fun. If you can, <laughs> uh, yeah. give me an idea of some of the questions that were posed about the solo music, because I'm curious. Well, there weren't any really any questions posed that I can recall. I mean, we basically just kind of gave our little talk about songs that you know were part of the part of the uh, that we thought were important enough to mention. And there was the and I did not mention it by the way. There was the idea that you could put together albums based on solo cuts you know, Beatle albums based on solo cuts, which we had a little discussion about recently. And I said, I don't particularly think that's a good, you know, that works, but some other, I mean, obviously there are other people that do. And, um, you know, so that was mentioned also. Um, but that's neither here nor there as far as I'm concerned, because I think solo material is what it is, solo material, and that should be, shouldn't be considered Beatles. I, I don't agree with that at all. Um, but, well, that's a whole yeah. other show to talk about. Right. <laughs> yes, and I'm sure we right, will so, do that at yeah. some point and come to nearly come to blows because you and I, I know we, we disagree on that. Um, but uh, And the other session was me interviewing Candy Leonard and uh, about her book, Beatleness, which, uh, as, I've, as I've written and as we have talked about, I think, um, I really, really think her book is fantastic. And I, and, uh, I hope uh, at some point we... Uh, well, I'd love to uh, hope we can interview her here, but I've interviewed Candy several times now, and uh, she her book is just marvelous in the way that it sets out the whole Beatle experience, not just in a general way. She's she's got credentials behind her. She's got a scholar, you know. She does it from an academic academic and a psychological viewpoint, which sounds weird, but when you read it, it's very it brings a lot of memories back. It's like, wow, is that why things happened the way they were and uh, why, the way they did? And it, and it's absolutely true. It's it's fantastic. So it's a very accurate, it's a very accurate 
distillation of what Beatlemania was, and at the beginning, and then how it how it uh, evolved over the years until the, the breakup of the group. And I heartily, I heartily recommend the book if you have not, if you've been considering it, if you see it somewhere, it's a, it's an excellent book. It really, really is. Yeah, and I should say that I was, I received a copy of the book, and it, and I will be getting to it. I'm just a few books behind right now, but uh, it's tough to keep up with all the Beatle books, you know. Yes. Did you start look? Did you look at it at all? Have you looked through it? I haven't, because I'm working on another book right now. So. Oh, okay. Okay. But I will yeah. get to it. I promise. <laughs> it's 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 really fantastic. It's, I mean, there are books. There are so many books that ex- try and, you know, put down the history of the Beatles or explain what um, the whole Beatle phenomenon phenomenon is. But this does it better, I think, than you know. This is in the uh, this does a, a very unique thing as far as I'm concerned. There are, have been, you know, other books like it that have explored from a personal point of view, but this does it more from a general fan point of view and what fans, you know, how fans reacted, why they reacted as they did, things like, you know, conflicts in families when, one, when a, say, an adult didn't like it, why girls screamed at concerts, you know, what the whole thing about Beatle haircuts for guys was like, you know, how social, uh, socially the whole situation worked out. There's a lot of sociological things in there. That sound, and, and the description I know probably sounds really dry, but when you read Candy's book, it's not. It's fantastic. It really, really is. It doesn't so. sound dry by, by what you just described there. So, oh, okay. you know, if anything, it's made me more intrigued by it. Okay. So I mean, it's, okay. it's one thing to read another book that that just discusses Beatle facts and what happened back then, but when you're talking about the psychological impact on a person, that's a whole other avenue there to explore. Right. And, and that's so that's, uh, that's what this does. It's not it's not just another you know dr- dry history. It's actually there's something very much behind it, and that's why I think it's so special. And it's gotten some some great you know endorsements on the back of the book, but that's it, that's kind of irrelevant to the fact that it's such a fantastic book. It really is. I don't normally get go gung ho on a book like I have on that book, and it's it's okay. well worth it's well worth you know uh, it's well worth the whole you know picking the book up. She hadn't even planned to come to Beetlefest until we did our interview, and I said you really ought to come, and she and she did, and um, so that was. You know that was really nice that that she did, and we got to meet and we got to talk and and everything. So, what can I say? Okay, now tell me about uh, Sunday morning. Chris Carter was there, and he did his own his breakfast with the Beatles show live at the fest. That was that was fantastic, really. That was one of the better uh-huh. events at the fest to see. I mean, if you've heard Chris's show, to see it live was fantastic, and he featured. You know, music, all the musicians, uh, or I should say, some of them. Um, Joey was a uh, Joey Mullen was on there. Um, Lawrence Juber was on there and played live. Um, Denny Lane came on and talked about the new reissues and talked about the. Yeah, in fact, uh, Carter. You know, Chris Carter's show always feature doesn't just feature studio material, it, or I should say, released recordings. Let me put it that way. It features mm. rare. Stuff, or I should say, he features. He doesn't feature just the 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 usual masters. He features rare songs, and he played the "Beware My Love" demo from the new reissues. Right. He played a, he played a couple. Of, he played uh, I believe the, it was the band on the run. Or he played a couple of things that that weren't uh, you know the standard um, uh, master recordings, and it was fun to hear that stuff. And uh, and um, so that was that was fun and. To listen to you know to listen to the show and and I he graciously and I I was very you know pleased obviously he graciously uh, had me on the show for a couple of minutes talking about you know Beatle news and stuff which I very much appreciated and Chris if you're listening thank you again but that was also that was a lot of fun too I mean but it was just fun even if I hadn't been on the show it was fun sitting there and we sat I think. We got there just after the show started, uh, my wife and I, and we sat and listened to the whole show. It was great. It was fantastic. So, okay. I was going to ask you, uh, did you catch any of the live performances 
of all the guests that were there. I did sit. Uh, I I caught a little bit of Peter Asher's show, which as usual, you know, which as it's as it as it is because I've seen it a couple of times now, it was fantastic. It was it was great. Uh, I and I was there for the finale on Sunday night, which was really special because it started with Liverpool. They went through. I believe it was a song. From each Beatle album, they started from the beginning, went all the way up through uh, Abbey Road, and then they introduced the guests once, one one at a time. About Billy Jay was first, Joey was sec- Joey Mullen was second, and then they brought out uh, Lawrence Juber, Denny Sywell, and Denny Lane, and they all played. And then Mark Hudson came out and did a bunch of rock and roll stuff, and then everybody came on at the stage, as is usually the case. And, uh, you know, Mark Lapidus and the Lapidus family and everybody else. And uh, I think even Frida, they even coaxed Frida to come up onto the stage, which was which was nice, um, mm-hmm. I think. And every, they did Hey Jude at the end. And that was that was wonderful. That was a, a great uh, finale, a great way to finish out the whole show. So that was well, that's that what was, they do. Yeah, that's what they do all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, I, I know. know that you you haven't you haven't seen the the fest in New Jersey like I have most years, but um, they always end the night with Liverpool backing up the guests, and then at the very end they all do Hey Jude. Right. So, when they that's an that's actually they used to do that 14 years ago when I went to the fest in Los Angeles. So it's you know I mean I knew that was uh, that's not something they have just you know, started doing a couple of years ago. That's something they've been doing traditionally for quite a while. So, uh, but that was, that was fun. Uh, there was a good crowd in there. Uh, everybody was dancing around and singing and they had the light show going and everything. It was, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Was it a very mixed crowd in terms of age? Seemed to me to be a little older crowd than, you know, more skewing a little older than younger. But there were not, there were enough younger people in there. But I think there were more older people than younger people. Um, right. So, well, one thing that did happen was that D. Elias, who wrote, um, I believe it's called uh, "Memory of a, Memories of a Beetle Maniac," recounts in her book how she stole a sock from P- Billy J. Kramer back in '64, and she gave him the sock back uh, at the fest. And um, so that was uh, interesting. That was uh, that was a, a funny incident. The whole story is in the book, and I won't go into the story. But let's just say she snuck into his hotel room while he was there, and he did not stop her. So that um, he was a, he was uh, asleep, I believe is, is the way she describes it in the book. But okay. um, so, but that happened in '64. Oh. So, okay. but anyway, that was that was one of the highlights of the. I mean, I, I should say that was one of the fun things of the weekend. But there was a lot of. I mean, there was. I mean, the the music was great. I got to I got to talk to so many people. I got to talk to and I got to meet Nancy Lee Andrews for the first time. I had not met Nancy, and we uh-huh. talked for a while. And so, and she has a great new book on Ringo, of Ringo pictures that uh, she so, she showed me. Um, I also talked to Rob Shanahan. He had, I was, I talked to him for a few minutes, and he had pictures of the sound check from Radio City with Paul that I had not seen before, and I was, oh, nice. floored, I was absolutely floored. It was, yeah, they were really nice, really, really nice, and I, I didn't even, I wasn't even aware that they had done a sound check or that there were pictures. But yes, Rob had pictures, and they were gr- and they were just fantastic. So okay, and one last thing: of all the people that you got to interview privately, is there any one person that you would cite as being mm, the most interesting, or one of the most interesting? One of the most interesting. I think the Rob Shanahan interview was very surpri- was the most interesting because of that sound check picture. Because I, 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 as soon as I saw it, I said, "What is that?" And he told me, and 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 he, we went through the whole story again, which I'm going to write about. I recorded, like I said, I recorded a bunch of interviews, and I'm going to be doing stories on all these. And he talked about the sound check. He talked about the whole 
you know, about uh, the whole uh, Radio City thing. And so we're going to be, uh, I'm going to be writing about these things over the next few weeks and going back into that. And um, But boy, that was such a great story uh, to, to, and a great picture to see that. You know, to see that again, um, that was just a lot of fun. So, but, um, yeah, I mean, talking about, you know, taking pictures with Ringo and everything like that, that was, it was a blast. It was a, it was a lot, a lot of fun. So. All right. Well, that, uh, puts the show to a close then. Steve, thanks so much for sharing your memories of the LA Fest. It was, it was, it was a lot of fun. And I want to say that, uh, I think, uh, we, you know, obviously we want to thank Mark Lapidus for doing that. I mean, it was great. And I really hope, um, obviously they haven't announced, you know, if they're coming back next year yet, but I really hope it does because it was a blast. It really was. So. Okay. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that went up to Steve and, uh, told him that they listened to the show and that they like it. So, uh, it makes us feel good. So thanks to all of you who uh, spent some time with Steve and uh, talked about our show. Yeah, I, I agree. Thank you all. It was great to hear that so many people really liked the show. So there we go. All right. <laughs> okay. For uh, Things We Said Today, this is Ken Michael saying thanks so much for listening, and I'll see you next time. And this is Steve Marinucci for Things We Said Today saying it was great to meet all of you at the fest, and we will see you next time. <laughs>